All right, here we go. Good morning. Welcome to week two, day one of the Games and Culture class. This is Dr. Zach Whalen, and I'm the professor for this class and for today. Sorry for the awkward start on today's stream. I had to restart it, um, but uh, good to see you all saying good morning. Good to see you. Thank you for saying good morning. Um, and let's see, it looks like about 10 people online, um, which is somewhat fewer than the total number of students in the class. So hopefully people are going to be coming online or they're catching up and watching things later, which is, which is fine and understandable. Um, so I've got a lot of things in mind today and I wanted to kind of talk through that, but, um, yeah, good morning. Why does that say object, object? I just noticed that that's unusual. Huh. Okay. Um, I think yeah, it's interesting. I'm just looking at the stream, the way that the chat is showing up on the stream here. And that's a, a plugin I'm using that pulls the chat from Discord. So I think that plugin is confused by some of your names. And so it's, uh, I can see your, I'm looking at the actual Discord screen so I can see who you actually are. So that's um, no worries there, but it's just kind of awkward the way that that looks. And I was wishing, I was hoping I could get the, your actual like uh, profile icons in this chat thing, but I couldn't, um, it doesn't work for some reason. Like it. The plugin says it's supposed to be pulling in icons, but it doesn't, so I don't know why. Anyway, um, hope you all had a, uh, an okay weekend. Um, yeah, hey, good morning. Lots of people saying hi. Um, I gotta say, I'll just um, you know be a little transparent here. I, I had a pretty rough weekend. I just, just mentally, I don't know. Um, last week was um, pretty weird and um, disturbing in a lot of ways, and I think I kind of helped my, uh, like focusing on class, like doing class Thursday, you know, with Reclaim Arcade, um, you know, and then like playing games on Friday, that was, that was something that was fun for me and I was kind of immersed in that and I didn't really have time to kind of sit back and process and, and um, I'm not someone who, who tends to be super pessimistic and stuff, but I, I, I don't know, I just, I've been doing a lot of doom scrolling this weekend. So I was kind of in a funk, um, just, you know, emotionally but uh, which is to say i have not that's um i haven't looked at your commercials yet or your reflections yet so if you still need to do that then please do um i do intend to look at those hopefully starting today but i just you know every now i would just sit down to work on it and then you know click a link and then just you know keep scrolling and it was just um not productive so anyway um this is uh day one of week two and we are um, continuing to look at video games in a historical sense, but also trying to understand these in a cultural context. And so part of today is to talk about cultural context and what we mean by specific uh, kinds of context and different kinds of, um, I guess, parts of culture. And specifically, I'm going to try to focus a little bit on gender today. Uh, we'll look at race a little bit tomorrow and uh, then kind of putting these kinds of observations into a methodology on Thursday and Friday, or Wednesday and Thursday uh, for this week. Uh, the big project this week is your close playing project. And I've added a, not really a project, but something else I'd like for you to do this week as you kind of think about and get ready for that, um, that project. And so I want to talk about that as well. That's going to be a gaming journal. And so you can see the agenda here laid out and several links in here. Uh, I want to start off by going through the overview of today and the things that I hope um, hope you can accomplish and learn today. Um, this page is not complete. I want to add some more notes and things, but you've got the, the, the outline over here and I want to work through the outline and then go through the, the detail. I do have a slideshow as I usually do. Um, and it's, you know, it's not as detailed as some of my other slideshows, but I think it's, I think it's okay. Um, all right, so here's the big thing that I want you to think about for today in terms of schedule. Uh, live streaming right now at 10, obviously. I want to come back again at one and do a live stream just to kind of wrap things up and reflect on things. But in between, um, I have three things I'd like for you to take a look at. And two are video games and one is an article. So uh, let me say a few words about each of these, at least, uh, well, not, I don't wanna say too much. I wanna uh, show you these and then uh, invite you to play these between lectures or between, you know, after I'm done talking, um, and, uh, and then also read a short article um, in uh, the journal Game Studies. So first of all, the game passage. 
Uh, I have it here. Um, I'm not going to play it on the stream right now, but it, you just click on the the screen where it hit where you have it here. You can play it full screen if you'd like. Um, it's a game from 2007 by Jason Rohrer. It's a game that is often thought of as an art game, and whenever people want to make the argument that games can be art, this is one of the games they often point to. The Museum of Modern Art in New York has exhibited this game as an example of video game art, um, and many people have talked to it and responded to it. It's something you, uh, it is something therefore you may have heard of or played yourself already. Um, but if not, I think it's still, it's, you know, it definitely is worth checking out and trying out and, and knowing about just as a historical thing. So play it. Um, it takes about five minutes to complete, um, but I would recommend playing it multiple times, maybe four or five times um, as you try to get to know it and understand it. So um, I don't want to say too much else about that. I want you to try to take it in its own terms. I want you to play it, try to understand what's going on, and then discuss it in Discord. You can use your... Um, your team channels to talk about it um, once you've played it. Uh, just to try to ask other people what they thought, to share your ideas, what you think is going on in the game, some of the things you thought were important about it. Uh, okay, so that's Passage, and again, it's just, I'm not gonna click play it now, but you click it, and then you'll figure out what's going on very quickly, I think. Okay, the other one I'd like you to play is Queers in Love at the End of the World by Anna Anthropy, and both of these games, I'm, this NB, the mature themes, both of these do have mature themes, although they're a bit more metaphorical in Passage. Um, they are fairly literal, and in, in this one, Queers in Love at the End of the World, it does deal with uh, sexuality, um, so, you know, just, I guess, bear that in mind. Um, it, again, is very easy to figure out, um, but you, uh, and you have to play it multiple times. Um, each time you play it takes 10 seconds. So um, it's a twine game. It's built in, um, built in twine, but it has a timer, and that's, uh, that's what we do. Um, Kelly, these games are very, very short. So these are, um, passage is five minutes, uh, and that's, you know, it'll feel like, it'll feel longer, honestly, but uh, five minutes is what I'm asking for here. And then for Queers in Love at the End of the World, it's 10 seconds, but you should play it multiple times to get a sense of it. Um, in fact, uh, I'll just go through it once or twice here. So you hit begin and then you read in the end like you always said It's just the two of you together. You have ten seconds, but there's so much you want to do kiss her hold her take her hand tell her you know, and I can't I can't read it out loud and uh, And also read it mentally and make a decision based on that so you can see it's based on Trying to get it done, you know, make a very quick decision, but there's lots of different uh, points within it And I think as you play with it, you'll, you'll uh, explore different uh, possibilities within the game so try that out, and then again, just talk about it uh, on your, in your channel, and uh, then at the on the one o'clock stream, I will also kind of um, re reflect on these and, and ask you to share your thoughts on the stream as well, um, based on what you played. And then finally, or not finally, I guess tertiarily, third thirdly, <laughs> uh, this is a game, uh, an article in the in the journal Game Studies, and this is about. Uh, well, as you see from the title here, uh, Archaeologies of Gender in Video, in video Game History. So in talking about gender, uh, I'm going to focus on how gender tends to work in video games, in video games. Um, but this is, uh, this is an article sort of about how gender works in video game history in terms of um, how we tell video game history and what we focus on, what we think is important in video game history. So it's a slightly different level. Uh, or layer to what I'm talking about today, but I think it's an important one to consider. And also it, it kind of builds out our idea of video game history that we uh, were focusing on a lot last week. So that's the idea for the in-between times today. And um, after class, I, I might add another thing, but probably not. Just the, the thing I'd like for you to do is this game journal. So let me tell you, say a little bit about this. I, I just created this little discussion post uh, right before I started the stream, so I'll add a, a prompt to this later, um, but uh, certainly don't do this until later anyway. Uh, this is, in this class I have often used a blog and I've asked students to cr uh, keep track of their gaming on a game journal, and I don't want to deal with blogs for this class because it's, it's so short. Um, so instead, I thought, you know, we can might as well use the, 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 sorry, the discussion settings, the discussion options in Canvas to uh, share ideas with each other about um, what we're playing. So uh, this week, I've asked you to choose a game and play through it this week. So I would like for you to uh, record your thoughts daily on this game this week uh, through these gaming journals. 
and I will write a prompt that will kind of cue you into uh, paying attention to some of the things that I'm going to talk about today in terms of gender. But also just these can be just like, here's what I did today. Here's how far along I got or whatever. It can be just kind of your notes as you as you progress. Again, I'll write a, a bit of a prompt here to explain what I intend for this. But um, there'll, there will be at least five of these. Well, I can tell, there will be five of these. Uh, these week, <laughs> five of these uh, gaming journal discussion pages this week. And my expectation is that you contribute to all of them. And I recommend, of course, doing it that day. Technically, you could do them retroactively, but I think that would be a ton of work. So I would really recommend just do it you know, as you, uh, as you make progress. So hopefully you've, you've uh, chosen a game, acquired it, um, and started playing it. Uh, that's uh, something that you'll need to um, you know, be progressing on this week. Uh, I am interested to hear what game you all chose. Uh, although I guess that's part of what I'll see by asking you to contribute to the gaming journal. Um, okay, so again, I'm going to add a prompt to that, but if you have any questions about it, uh, go ahead and let me know, and I'll try to answer them. Okay, cool. So let's take a look then at some slides. Let me do my normal thing to share this. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got a chainsaw. Whoa. <laughs> I just heard a chainsaw and then crack and thud. So somebody, somebody is chopping down something out there. Um, okay, so let's see, share. Um, and that's a link. Can view, yeah, that's good. So Ryan asks, what if you happens if you beat the game and you pick before the end of the week? Uh, well, it depends. I guess it depends on how soon you beat it. Like, um, if you've already finished it, um, you might want to just pick another one. Um, but if it's something you finished, you know, maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, then even after you finish playing it, you can still reflect on it or have thoughts on it based on the things that, that come up in our in my lectures and the, in discussions. So it's something that, so these, these game journals aren't just, here's what I played today. Uh, they could be also like here's what I noticed about what I played and so that could be something you can notice retroactively or you could replay sections I imagine so I guess it all that's to say it, it depends yeah, it Looks like Meg's typing um, Yeah, yeah some of these are fairly short. I mean especially uh, 30 flights of loving in fact I almost regret including that because of how short it is uh, just, It doesn't give you I mean there's some interesting stuff there, but it doesn't I don't know if it, if it really merits like a week of work, essentially, if that makes sense. Um, what have you all chosen, by the way? I'm just, since a couple of you are in the green team, are uh, suggesting you might be almost done. Uh, what have you all chosen? 80 days? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, that's one you can definitely replay, Maddie. Like, uh, that's one that um, offers so many possibilities uh, that you that you should replay it. Like, I, re I really recommend it. Um, Gone Home does not have as much replay value, I think. I think it is still a really interesting game, but I think um, kind of once you know what's going on, you know, that's a, the that's a thing. So Bioshock, I'm impressed if you're almost done with it. Like that's, you know, that's a 20 to 40 hour game depending on how well you proceed through it. Um, so yeah, I mean, and that's a good idea, Ryan. Maybe just keep playing more Bioshock games. Uh, I think Bioshock 2 is pretty good. I think uh, the Minerva's Den add-on is better. Um, but I think it's, it, you know, it, it definitely, there's lots of Bioshock content you can experience for, uh, you know, a week, uh, for several hours over, over a week there. Yeah, Stanley Parable, I think also, I don't know how, if you, I don't know how replay goes, but certainly there are moments you might want to revisit and think about and, and talk about. So, um, yeah, basically, I, I just want these games to be kind of resources for you to mine and think about as we uh, try out different ideas and different lenses for looking through looking at video games. So today, talking about gender, like um, how does this, how does your artifact uh, speak to gender, or how does gender appear in it? How does it, you know, operate in terms of the game mechanics and, and so on, or not? I mean, it may not be a good example, and that's kind of the um, that's kind of the point is that sometimes a particular lens like gender studies might give us a way to understand something 
um, for one game, but maybe not work as well for others. And trying out different lenses is part of what we do uh, in in, um, in the work of criticism. So that's uh, that's okay if it doesn't. Uh, but that's that's the prompt. Like that's what I'm gonna prompt you to do. In addition to kind of your um, here's what I did today discussion. Um, all right, cool. So let's um, let me go into my slides. Uh, this is uh, or wait, I see Al typing. He often has a question, so I'll see if he has a question. I'll, let, I'll finish that thought and then, I mean Colin, I'll let, let you finish your thought and then I'll go from there. Oh, good. Sorry, I just saw my, um, while he's typing, um, you know, I mentioned my bird feeder sometimes. Um, oh, good morning. <laughs> I'll just say good morning. Uh, I have actually, one of, I find when I get sort of depressed and anxious, I like to make things, so like build things physically um, or fix things. So I fixed my daughter's towel bar, uh, but I also uh, I worked on my car a little bit and I uh, installed a webcam on my bird feeder. So I'm, uh, I, like I built a, a structure to attach a webcam to and I've got the webcam on it. Um, I need to add a little bit more like weatherproofing to it. Um, but I, the main thing I need is I need a cable long enough to plug into my computer. And I, I, that, that just arrived, the cable just arrived. So um, hopefully tomorrow I'll be able to actually uh, put my bird feeder feed onto uh, the live stream. So whenever there's an interesting bird that shows up, I can switch to it and show you what I'm, what I'm seeing out my window. Uh, I saw a, a group of uh, juncos and sparrows this morning. It was interesting kind of watching them because there's one sort of bigger sparrow that sort of kept kicking out the juncos. Like, um, and I, I I've seen, I've seen blue jays do that, but I've never seen a sparrow be that like territorial and aggressive. So I was kind of interested in that. Um, also, it occurs to me I might want to move my bird feeder because its location is kind of awkward and certain birds may not be able to get to it very well. And also, um, I think since only one side of it is accessible, that kind of gives those bullies like the sparrow an opportunity to kick out other birds. Whereas if it were, if both sides were accessible, then like the the jerk bird can be over here and then another bird can kind of sneak up on the other side and get a mouthful and then fly away so like i, I think uh, i might try to position it in a way that's a bit more uh egalitarian all right cool so let's uh let's take a look at some slides and go through it a little bit um, as you can see here the big question is you know we're talking about culture we're talking about video games so uh, where does gender fit into all that and and i think it's basically you know um both ways bird just hit the window um, not hit the window but like trying to land on it <laughs> okay dumb birds um, so the <laughs> birds are interesting but they are also like dumb too and that's kind of why they're interesting maybe I don't know all right let's see uh, let me kind of start this over again all right so this is this is going to be I should say uh, very much a scratching the surface kind of presentation uh, I mean there are entire classes and fields of study focused on gender and I'm not going to try to summarize all of that or replicate that I just want to give you some very basic ideas uh, that help us understand what to look for what we're talking about when we talk about gender uh, in the context of video games um, also I should acknowledge like when we talk about things like gender identity this is something that um, I, I have to kind of acknowledge my own uh, experience of and my own position on. Um, I am a cisgendered a heterosexual male and uh, I mean I even have blonde hair blue eyes and so this is the kind of identity that some people I think have um, aptly uh, described as easy mode in terms of going through life and yeah I mean it's something that when we talk about uh, especially gender different gender identities or um, uh, gender identities that are intersectional with other kinds of identities in ways that contribute to oppression uh, these are things that um, I have not experienced and so uh, I'm really talking about gender as a, a, a the, you know uh, I, when I talk about gender it's it's something that um, some of you may have very different experiences of and uh, different thoughts about and that's that's fine and that's good I just wanted to acknowledge my own um, my own position uh, in that uh, in that question so but I hope I can still share some thoughts that are valuable and interesting and ways to kind of lay some uh, some groundwork as we get into it uh, in fact we have to actually go through it a little bit to get to it so um, first of all and this is kind of the underlying assumption that informed really the whole class this is uh, video games are cultural artifacts and I want to expand on this a little bit before even really getting to gender uh, to understand what we're talking about when we talk about cultural artifacts and video games as cultural artifacts right 
Okay, so uh, if we think of culture, like, and just kind of try, if we try to come up with a basic definition of what we mean by culture, um, I think that in many cases we will find ourselves seeing it as the opposite of or the other to uh, nature. So nature is um, on one end of this very rough kind of uh, uh, continuum I've created, and then culture is on the other side. So culture is sort of the thing that opposes nature uh, in some ways. But this is, it's in between. And so whatever we think of as our identity, our reality, our existence, our social standing, our status, uh, this is some elements that are simply natural, some elements that are cultural. And um, it's a blend of those and how we feel about different parts of those things will vary, of course, but uh, in some cases we can talk about things as being constructed. And when we do, we're talking about culture. Uh, in some cases we can think of things as simply existing. And in that case, we're talking about nature. So this is you know, this is very rough, obviously, but if we think of culture as constructed things uh, and nature as things that just are, uh, then I think it helps us at least establish a fundamental kind of uh, playing field for discussing these things. And I think, you know, the way I'm talking about this it even has kind of game-like structures to it. So I think that's also maybe another relevant uh, intersection. Uh, okay, so thinking about culture, there's lots of things we could think of as examples of culture. So these are, th when I say things that are constructed, I do in include material technology, but that also includes the immaterial things like, like family structures, like rituals, like governments. Um, these are things that we as humans have constructed in order to make our lives what they are, and in most cases better. And, but these are not, in many cases, natural. These are, these are things that we have developed or created or evolved or um, changed and replaced. Um, there's quite a few things that we can put under this, uh, again, a very broad label, but these are things that are constructed, things that we have, uh, that we have made. Okay, and when we're talking about the things that we have made, uh, I'm interested in artifacts because a an artifact is, uh, this is just, again, a very rough definition. An artifact is uh, a material remnant of a culture and it tells us about what a culture valued and how that culture behaved. And if you notice, I'm, I'm using the past tense here because this is a way of thinking about material culture that comes from the field of archaeology. So an archaeologist finds an artifact, they know, have an idea what culture it came from, and their job as an archaeologist is to interpret that object in its context, like to explain what that culture used that object for and what that use tells us about that culture and the way it was organized and who got to do things and who got to use this thing and who who did they use that thing on um, and i'm talking very general ways but this is hopefully something that um you, you, that that makes sense um, if you look at the uh like like um I, I I often share the same anecdote because it was really compelling to me. But um, I live near uh, George Washington's Ferry Farm, uh, well, the Ferry Farm location where George Washington lives. Many of you are probably familiar with it uh, in Fredericksburg. And they, it's a couple of years ago, uh, they had their July 4th thing that they always do, and they had various archaeologists on site talking about some of the artifacts. And so they had like a shot of a shard of pottery and. Um, I talked to the one of the archaeologists there, and she was saying how, you know, with this, like they could find this little fragment, they could find the piece that this came from, and then in a catalog, and then figure out who made it and who would have bought it and how much it would have cost, and then once we understand like how much would the family that lived there have spent on, like a soup urn, like that gives you a sense of what they thought was important about their life and how much money they had to spend on pottery and like you know it tells us so much that we can just we can kind of fill in so much detail just from that one little shard and then their lives become this this richer our, our sense of their lives becomes this much richer much more realistic kind of thing so it's interesting how we can do that and i think this is something that we take for granted as far as looking at the past but i i want us to try to work on uh, looking for and looking through those same lens same lenses uh, in the present so material artifacts uh, and uh, oftentimes we talk about trash and i don't mean this to say that video games are a kind of trash, but um, I heard this on the radio the other day. This is a, an archaeological dig going on in Baltimore, and the the researcher said something about the trash. Uh, they were talking specifically about outhouses, but um, they're saying the great thing about these is that most people don't think about what they throw away. It's out of sight, out of mind, so it gives us an unbiased sample of what people had. So when you look through the trash pile, it's just, you know, what was um, the stuff that they didn't curate, the stuff that um, they didn't try, the, the past wasn't trying to tell the future about themselves, but that they um, revealed unconsciously. And that's much more um, useful, much more interesting, right? Much more valuable. 
Um, and uh, this idea that trash is a proxy, proxy for human behavior. Again, I don't want to argue that video games are trash. <laughs> That's not my point here. Although there, there's a slight, there's an example I do want to show you. But um, this idea that these are just there, like the, thing, the, the dis discarded object tells us as much about that society as, and maybe more about that culture that produced it than the preserved artifact, the thing in, in, in uh, the museum. Um, <laughs> you're not trash killing. Um, okay, so the, uh, uh, sorry, I see. Um, okay, oh, so this is a trash thing. Sorry, I'm looking back in, um, back in the chat here. Uh, Colin had a longer comment or something we have to say. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, I, I so uh, Colin's comment here has to do with um, gender expectations and marketing and like so-called girl games. I imagine is that what you're thinking of, or I mean that there's a general category that that way. But um, yeah, so, so you mentioned uh, gendered expectations for certain kinds of categories, and I think you're talking about. Uh, I guess we could say stereotyping, but like the idea that first-person shooters are games for boys and uh, puzzles uh, are games for girls, or um, you know, my daughter has a Barbie game, so like. And that game, by the way, is ridiculous. I, um, <laughs> and um, the uh, uh, I, I don't have a slide about this, but I just uh, in terms of tangents, like so, it's a it's a Barbie some Barbie dream house or something. And so, uh, this is my youngest daughter. She's six, so she she likes Barbie. She likes stuff like that. She has she does all this you know plays with them a lot. She really likes sort of playing with uh, dolls and and sort of building little scenes and talking there. She like talks for them and everything. It's really cute. Um, so she has kind of a version of that in her on a Kindle. She plays through that, but I I was a little disturbed by like you, it's like Barbie you can be anything or something like that. There's different careers you can be as Barbie. Um, one of them is a social media influencer, um, and so I, I mean I have not actually spent a lot of time looking at the game. I should obviously, but I just kind of like listening to her play it and uh, overhearing while I was making dinner and like the game. I heard things like Barbie saying, "Like, um, uh, let's look at our phone," uh, and like, "This is going to get so many likes," and uh, like, that's such. I mean, that's a different conversation, but just like this idea that that's the thing that you get to play at, at you get to play at being a social media influencer is such an annoying and disturbing thing to me. So I'm. I've told her not to do that anymore, but I, I actually do want to spend a little time looking at the game and trying to figure out what it's actually doing, and maybe I, you know, maybe I should analyze it and uh, and so on. But she doesn't. My daughter does not have a social media presence, obviously, so it's not something that she's going to emulate anytime soon. But still, just like the idea that that's built into this game as a thing to strive for, I think is really disturbing. Um, anyway, and also like a very gendered kind of thing to strive for, right? Like the idea of like, when you say social media influencer, you probably think of women or you think of that as like particular influencers and high profile uh, influencers as which are, who are, are, are women. Um, so that's another kind of gendered uh, expectation. Anyway, um, I have this picture of trash here. <laughs> um, and uh, I want to talk about this a little bit uh, because when we're talking about video games and trash, you can't not talk about the Atari 2600 um, ET extraterrestrial story, or at least it, it occurred to me as very interesting, very relevant. And um, I think uh, I think Colin even mentioned this the other day: the idea of that ET, the extraterrestrial, killed the video game industry. And some people will say it that way. I think that's overstating it, but it definitely was a, a well-known uh, failure and contributed certainly to the uh, economic downturn for the industry in the early 1980s. So um, this is this is uh, a story related to that. There's a whole documentary about this story. I think. Um, <laughs> I think that it's uh, a, a, it's a good story. I think it's um, often it, it well it was circulated as a kind of urban urban legend for a while, but it was also just like true, like it was already well documented. And so whenever uh, there's a documentary you can watch, the documentary kind of has this narrative of like we're gonna find out if this urban legend is real. Um, but it just was real, like it was already well known in video game history, like it was a thing that. We, we knew where it was, it's just like, uh, we don't want to do it. But the, the storyline goes that uh, Atari um, made millions of um, millions of uh, ET consoles, uh, ET cartridges 
couldn't sell them, so they dumped them in a landfill and buried. They were so embarrassed by their failure, they buried the evidence in this landfill in New Mexico. Um, it was more just like they had a ton of overstock in t not just uh, <laughs> ET, but they, they just overproduced, and so it you know they they um, threw it away. Um, and it didn't include just the the ET cartridges that you can see here. There's a centipede, and actually the Atari 2600 port of centipede is not terrible, um, but it's you know it's def they had too much of it and they threw it away. You can see it looks like uh, looks like Frogger maybe there uh, the other one, um, but anyway it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is that they had um, they had overstock and they had to get rid of it, so they threw it away. Um, so digging that this particular trash archive has uh, a lot more value because it has been dug up now There's documentarians who went out there and uh, you know, they found out where it was and they dug it up and so on And uh, I don't know that I don't remember the names off the top of my head But uh, it's a, it's an interesting documentary. It's worth like, checking out, but I think it, it sort of over dramatizes the narrative quite a bit and as evidence of that over dramatization this is a uh, eBay listing um, I looked at it this morning and this is the the cost. This is um, a Atari ET uh, game on eBay that you can purchase for only uh, one, almost one point two million dollars. If you, uh, if you would like. Uh, now I say, uh, if you would like uh, that, this particular listing has been on eBay for a couple of years now, so it has not been purchased. Um, but if you want to uh, spend that much money, I guess you can, or you could. Um, how about this? You could just get. Uh, you, um, ET for Atari 2600 um, for a dollar, and uh, you could then tell everybody that you found it in a landfill. Um, and uh, it, it's it's really interesting. Right? I mean, it's interesting how uh, the the provenance of that particular one. Uh, where is my tab? There it is. Uh, the, the provenance of this particular one supposedly adds so much value to it. Uh, it's 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 kind of ridiculous. Um, I do know that I do remember seeing listings for uh, other artifacts from the landfill that were not this expensive. So I imagine they sold. I imagine people uh, could have bought them at you know maybe a thousand or two thousand um, dollars. I can't imagine anyone spending one point two million dollars on this. Um, but you know maybe there are a couple other uh, listings like this that are uh, ET games um, with different artifacts. So this one particular one comes with it's a game. It comes with the the game, the packaging, the certificate, and a jar of dirt from the landfill, which is just amazing. And uh, there's others that have different uh, different combinations of things. Um, I already have it on a slide, but since I'm already here, let's take a look at it. So this is one that includes, this is 1.1. 1 .1. Um, oh my gosh, okay, this is cool. So <laughs> I just see what this is. Okay, so this is um, you know $1 million on this particular, this one here that includes the game. It includes some other stuff too, which I think looks kind of interesting. Um, but I just saw this, so I'm gonna click on this here. So this is a throw pillow that is made to look like an Atari box that had, has been dug up from the landfill. I kind of I want this, um, actually. <laughs> That's definitely a unique gift. That's crazy. Uh, I really like that. Uh, this this to me is much more interesting than the cartridge, because uh, I already have like three of the cartridges. Like it's not like the cartridge itself, the game itself, um, is not particularly rare. I mean, the thing they they made millions of them. So uh, the actual ET cartridge, which it's, I don't have it here in my room at the moment, but um, it's it's crazy, right? Um, let's see. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm going back here. Yeah, a million dollars. Yeah, I, I agree. It's not really worth it. Um, it does belong in a museum, but like, you know, it should just just give it to a museum. Like, it's not particularly rare. Um, so anyway, so these are these are ways in which you know the the trash. Like the fact that this was in the trash, it creates this whole story. And and that whole story here, you can see how much some people might value it as over a million dollars. Um, and that adding that much value to it again is questionable, um, but not entirely far-fetched in that I certainly could imagine spending like maybe $100 for a, a, an actual cartridge from the landfill uh, as opposed to $2 uh, for just a, a standard cartridge. So uh, it's not about the game content itself, it's about the context that we imagine for that game content that we're, that we're focusing on there. Um, okay, so 
So the point is, uh, and that I was trying to say, is that when we talk about games as cultural artifacts, um, it do they don't have to be good cultural artifacts. Like uh, that Barbie game or the E.T. game can tell us just as much about the, the context that produced them as uh, Cyberpunk 2077 can tell us about the, co the context that produced it now. Like, so we can talk about, uh, basically, we can talk about bad games as well as good games. And, and a game being good or bad doesn't really tell us much about whether we can analyze it and learn from it. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping you all are able to do uh, in this class in general, is learn how to analyze and talk about video games. So let's talk about uh, a couple other things. Um, yeah, or just another way of saying the same thing, uh, whether we're talking about trash or treasure, right? These are, art and this is kind of a technical word, but artifactual lenses. In other words, this is an artifact through which we can understand the context that produced it, uh, hopefully, right? Or that's, that's what we attempt to do. We attempt to look through it, not just at it, but through it to the context that produced it. And that's what we're after here. So let me see. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, right, yeah, so the Zelda Phillips CDI games are another example of um, just uh, interesting trash, and they tell us a lot about kind of what's, well, the, uh, by contrast with like the NES Zelda games, for one thing, just they had, we, we kind of get the, um, from the Zelda CDI games, we get the idea that maybe we don't need like, high, you know, maybe the quality of the imagery, like, or the, the cartooniness of the imagery doesn't actually uh, make it a better game. Uh, but also, maybe it's just not worth that much. Uh, money. Yeah, cool. All right, so let's talk a little briefly about gender as a social construct. Um, these are just a couple of general statements about gender from the context of thinking of it as a social construct. Uh, so that means that we're thinking of uh, it's, uh, and this is again very general, and this is by general I mean referring to different cultural ideas about this and different cultures' ideas about gender. Uh, but we tend to think of it as a binary and then variations on that or iterations of that binary. And even when we think about uh, non-binary uh, gender or gender as a continuum or as a fluidity, we tend to think of it as somewhere along those ten two poles. And I say we and I say tend, um, that's, that's just kind of the received idea. And I think we may, rec in recognizing that gender is a social construct, uh, reject the extremities of either of those poles. Um, but most of the time we are still talking about it as, as having two poles between masculinity and femininity in terms of these things. Um, Again, very general, very debatable, but um, well, I mean, these are, yeah, again, these are just uh, ways into this conversation here, so don't read too much into this. Um, but uh, we, we tend to think of gender as different from sex and from sexuality. And so when we talk about masculine and feminine, we're not, that's not the same as distinguishing between male and female or heterosexual and homosexual. These are uh, different ways of thinking about identity, all relevant, all worth interest, all interesting and worth talking about. But when we're um, talking about gender, specifically we're thinking about masculinity and femininity, uh, which is to say we're thinking about roles or positions or statuses within a cultural context. Um, these can be distinct, um, but they can also be mutable. In other words, they can change. Um, the, the status of a particular gender identity could change over time or be replaced with something else. Um, we, we can, you know, we can think differently about those things over time, right? Um, oh yeah, just looking at here, <laughs> thanks for sharing that, uh, um, you know, and actually, so I didn't have this up as an example, but the Zelda games are kind of interesting in terms of, uh, of gender, right? And, um, if you, I, I don't have any slides for this, so I, I can't, and it's hard to explain if you're not familiar with the example, but, um, we call these the Zelda games, like the Legend of Zelda. Zelda is the, yeah, exactly, right. So Zelda is the, um, the princess. Uh, you play as Link and you're rescuing her in the original. In Ocarina of Time, Zelda is actually two different characters. Um, she is Princess Zelda, but she's also Sheik, who's a kind of ninja. And uh, that is kind of, I'm kind of spoiling a game that's 25 years old, but um, the uh, yeah, so there's a character named Sheik who you encounter several times as kind of a ninja. Uh, eventually that is revealed to be uh, actually Zelda in disguise. So um, an interesting way to critique that is that, uh, so on the one hand it's good, like it's cool that Zelda actually has agencies, like Zelda the person can be both the kind of um, feminine princess who's rescued and a uh, um, also the masculine Sheik who is, or at least um, um, uh, gender ambiguous um, ninja who can help link along. Um, critics have noted that Zelda still has to perform as somewhat more masculine in order to have that agency. So she has to kind of cast off her princessness in order to take on her 
um, ninja-ness and her masculinity is, and so it's, it's still kind of, some people might say, playing into the difference of, of those gender roles, but still pretty interesting. Oh yeah, that's true, Ganon uh, is the only male of a species. Yeah, I mean, right, they're not humans, so it's hard to, uh, hard to imagine how that would work. But uh, I'm enjoying this gif just playing in, on a loop in Discord of the, the laughing there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's a lot of interesting ways you can break down and break out different gender roles once you start looking at them in this case. So I just, again, these are just sort of general statements about gender, right? So these are things that we can think of as identity. Um, we can think of uh, expressing those identities and uh, the, the um, uh, and pronouns are an example of where we think about identity through, uh, where we think about gender identity in the context of language. And so uh, language is, a cultural construct. It's a language is a thing that humans created in order to get things done, and it has as part of its structure uh, gendered pronouns. At least English, the English language does, and other languages do as well. And they have different structures and so on. But um, we have a way of referencing masculinity or femininity through uh, he his uh, pronouns or um, her hers kind of pronouns. And so these are these are things that that. Um, become immaterial traces of the cultural construct of gender in language. Hope that makes sense. Um, again, I you know this is not some this is not a field I um, like that. Uh, this is, basically, it is a field. Gender studies is a whole field of study, and so I'm not, I'm just trying to hit some highlights here to give us some pieces in our toolkit as we start to uh, access uh, video games. Uh, okay, so yes, yeah, Colin, that's what I was just saying. All right, so um, let's see. Um, all right, so here's, if we think about how gender works, and so this is a kind of a discussion question, and I, by discussion, I don't know if we can have a whole conversation about it because I'm, I'm the only one verbally talking, you all are typing if you choose to. Um, but if we think about this statement here, uh, I'm wondering if you, what your response is. So one's gender affects one's opportunities, status, and impact on others. And so I, I mean this in the real world sense. Like, do you agree or disagree? Um, what do you think? Um, what do you think we're getting at here? Um, so again, yeah, I'm actually posing this question. You feel free to answer it in the chat. Uh, d does one's gender affect one's opportunity, status, and impact on others? And it's a big question. It's actually maybe a uh, maybe an awkward question, maybe a difficult question. Okay, interesting. Um, so Meg has a pretty interesting uh, complaint. <laughs> um, the yeah, which is kind of you know already applying what I'm asked, the, 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 applying the question I'm posing here. But the idea that the default character is always male, right? That that's almost always the case. Uh, of course, there are notable exceptions like Metroid, but um, games kind of take for granted that like you will choose the masculine character whenever you can or that that's the only character or if there are multiple options that you have the male first and then you can elect to make that as female if you feel like it and that's uh, that's interesting yeah all right cool so it seems like most of you tend to seem to agree with this which is I mean I, I do um, uh, unfortunately I think it is male privilege is very real as Ben just says and like I said earlier at the outset of this, this is definitely something like I experienced, like that's something that I have to acknowledge is, has contributed to my success. And like I said, easy mode, right? It's people, that's sort of a joke people make about um, white male privilege, but it's something that, uh, you know, that's the only experience I have, but I, I, have, I can certainly look at different parts of my life and different opportunities I've had and different, um, uh, I guess things that were easy for me to choose to do, and uh, I can only imagine. I have to, you know, that's um, all I can do. But I, I can only imagine that those options might not have been there, or might have been different for someone with a different gender. And I think the difference, the, the difficulty, Colin, is like we, if, if you have, when you when you possess privilege you don't know it. I mean, it's, it's, that's kind of why it's privilege, you know, like you, there are different kinds of privilege, obviously, but, um, the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but the, you can only, it's almost like you can only experience it when you don't have it. And so that's what, it, why it makes 
that's why it's hard for someone like me, and I, I'm just you know trying to be honest here, uh, as white a white male, a cis, cisgendered heterosexual male, um, you know I do have to sometimes work to relate to or think to other think about other points of view. Like I have to I have to actually um, it, it's not automatic. It's something I have to to work on, um, and to, to understand how different points of view might experience uh, the same reality differently or have their own reality. And that's true. So Kate has a good point there. She's writing it parenthetically, but uh, traditional masculinity expectations also have negative consequences for men too. Yeah, and so you could say like some of the things say, um, the uh, if you're talking about like some of the things that I think Meg was re uh, referencing, the idea that you know being a woman in a gaming community and you know that that's the challenges of that I think have to do with uh, toxic uh, masculinity. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, so I, I know what you said. I, I take your point, Colin. I mean, it's not recognizing that, I mean, I want to recognize that just because I, um, like privilege doesn't mean things are easy. Uh, things that, it means things are not, not as hard as they might be otherwise, I guess. Um, and it's again, hard to say because we don't know, like we don't have another version of me that has a different identity that we can compare me with. Um, but it just means, you know, we have to acknowledge how certain things have have been easy. I, I mean, I, you know, I certainly, you know, it's even things like growing up middle, cla middle class, um, you know, my dad was a computer engineer programmer. And so I had access to technology very early on. Like these are things that um, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it, Kate. <laughs> nice. I like the emoji <laughs> responses. Yeah. And this is interesting, by the way, like you all are having in many ways a richer discussion with each other than, you know, what I'm able to add. So um, yeah, this is kind of, um, I mean, it's it's good to go like that. Yeah, I think Colin, that's another good way to put it. Yeah, and it's it's the thing like we have a hard time. We have to imagine other people's bumps <laughs> to kind of uh, hash your metaphor. Uh, uh, that's sort of the the challenge. That's what we have to do. I mean, that's what learning is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, good point. Um, Cool. And I wish, by the way, this thing here in the Discord chat, it actually doesn't show emoji either, and I wish it did. So I'm going to see if that might be another way to include the chat. I'm just using, like, Discord actually provides this little widget here for you to include as a, as a stream. And I wonder if there might be another way to do that. Um, anyway, I'm enjoying the discussion, so feel free to, to continue that. I just had a couple more thoughts about uh, specific applications of video games. I think the Zelda example is great, so thank you for adding that in. I have some others, but um, I think that's... Uh, that's excellent. So um, let's talk about this in and kind of put this in a, a slightly more technical way. Uh, I want to think about when I think about gender in video games, I want to pose to you two different ways of thinking about it and show you examples of both of these points of view. Um, what's happening? What? Where's the rest of my slides? Okay, I got it. Maybe this particular view of it didn't update. There it is. Okay, so um, uh, so if we're thinking about video game, video games and gender, then we might um, there's actually two different questions we might actually be asking whether we do that, um, whether we acknowledge that or not. Uh, and the first is going to focus on representation. So if we're studying gender in video games and we're focusing on representation, we would be asking questions like how do women look, what do, and what role do they play in the story. Um, in other words, are they dressed in a way that appeals to sexuality, to their to their being sexual objects, um, or do they are they dressed in a way that seems more practical or appeals to their sexual agency? Um, or uh, so that's one way to look at it. Um, and also, like, what role are they playing in the story? So at the narrative level, what job do they have? Um, what are they What are they supposed to do? So this is uh, this is Princess Peach, and um, this is. This is just the, I think the original sprite, I just, you know, Googled it and found it and just sort of, uh, you know, awkwardly cropped it. Um, but this is Princess Peach and, you know, if, I, I hope you played the classic Super Mario Brothers at some point in your life. There's plenty of opportunities too if you've never ha had a chance to, uh, if you want to play it online. But in that game, you play as Mario or Luigi and you uh, your goal is to rescue Princess Peach. Um, it's an extension or an elaboration of the same basic plot line that takes place in Donkey Kong, uh, where you try to rescue, um, what, I'm blanking on her name. Some of you will probably know it before I do. Is it Pam? I want to say Pamela, but I think that's wrong. I think it's Paulina. Uh, but basically the same sprite, the same graphic. Um, and uh, your job is to rescue her from uh, Donkey Kong. Um, in any case, 
that's she doesn't you can't play as her you can't do anything that's that's all she is in super mario 2 of course you could play as princess peach and then in many of the other subsequent games like mario kart um, but the original scenario was she exists to be rescued so she is an object of the narrative in that sense uh, another classic one uh, this is miss pac-man and miss pac-man is great um I, we told a little bit of the story of miss pac-man on thursday when we talked about that you know, Miss Pac-Man, there is a narrative context around Miss Pac-Man, so she is there as kind of a sexual partner or a romantic interest for uh, Pac-Man, who is not, you'll notice, Mr. Pac-Man or Mr. Pac, and she's not Mrs. Pac, she's Ms. Pac-Man, which is kind of awkward linguistically, but, you know, this is, uh, she's basically Pac-Man with a bow and, and lipstick and a mole. I forgot about the beauty mark, um, but she's uh, she does the same thing. She eats ghosts and, or she runs away from ghosts, eats pellets, and then chases the ghosts. So the basic scenario, but she has a slightly more complicated game, complicated gameplay. Um, she's really, you might almost say she's Pac-Man and drag. Like she's not so much a, a fully fleshed out character as just a, a feminine representation of a masculine character uh, that we already have. Um, yeah, what is Pac-Man? Uh, I mean, there was the whole like Pac-Man cartoon show. So if you want to actually kind of explore the Pac-Man mythology. There's, there was a whole storyline around it. I don't, I don't think I ever watched it, but they had uh, children, I think. So they were, and I, I think if I remember correctly, on the, t they, on the TV show, it was like a sitcom. Um, but yeah, I don't think I ever watched it. So I can't tell you much more about that. But if you want to learn more about the Pac-Man universe, then by all means. Um, okay, so the, another classic case study in gender and representation in video games is of course Lara Croft from Tomb Raider and this is actually a stylized version of the 1996 version I was trying to find just a good basic straightforward image of Lara Croft um, just in case you're not familiar with her um, I just want you know as evidence of the awkwardness or the problematic status she has or complicated status she has in the gaming community um, I had to turn my safe search filters on in order to find something that wasn't pornographic in the first several uh, rows of results when I was just looking for you know basically just an image of Lara Croft that illustrates how her image has become super sexualized or was notorious for being super sexualized um, without being literally pornographic and there's a lot of that so um, but this is Lara Croft this is um a, again, a stylized version of her. I think this image actually might come from one of the cover, uh, the box art from uh, one of that, that era, but she's classically presented this way. Um, very large breasts, um, big eyes, um, very narrow waist, uh, very, uh, you know, a stylized body basically, but realistic enough that many people felt that she was uh, over-sexualized. And so whenever, she, so she becomes a really interesting study case study in analyzing video games because we can look at her in a couple different ways like we could look at her either as an object of sexual desire um, or we could look at her as an agent in gameplay like she's the one you know basically raiding the tombs like in tomb raider so she's the one you play as and you do things as she's the default character she's the only character you play as in those games and um in that sense she has agency she's like a female indiana jones um and yet she is both so she's both um, object of desire and subject of the action. And so that difference, the actual, the actual uh, tension between those points of view is pretty interesting when we're looking at it in the context of representation. Um, so let's see if you, uh, yeah, RTX must be on for this one. I think it was just a style, like an illustration based on it, but yeah, I, I get the joke. Yeah, and of course, so as Ben's noting, um, th this character has been rehabilitated over the years in different versions and iterations. Um, she is uh, much more realistic in more recent games, much more, um, like, uh, I guess gritty, I guess maybe a word to put it, but much less of a, uh, uh, much less of a sexual, a sex object, uh, I guess is one way to, to put it. Yeah, she, she is not, uh, not very realistic at all in terms of the original. Um, and that's, that's how it goes, right? Yeah, and I think, I don't know if you're, and when you, again, like if I was Googling this morning, you can find lots of pretty interesting side-by-side -side comparisons like that or progressions of how her character has evolved. I mean, she is a character among, who really stands out in video game history as um, like really being iconic for her representation, like for, for her appearance, for what she represents. Um, it's something that people have talked about for a long time, it turns out. Okay, so that's uh, the representational sense of gender. Um, let me shift gears a little bit here to the other sense of gender, and I know I'm going past, it's, uh, it's 11, so I'm going to wrap up pretty soon. I'm almost, just a few more slides. Um, 
which is so if we're thinking instead of if we want to think about gender in video games the other way of thinking about it besides representation i want to argue is through operation or processes or uh, through rules and so this is a question you might be asking how does gender status relate to mechanics or rules or how is it represented in rules so this is a screenshot from a game called the marriage by rod humble i don't know if it's the best game but it at least illustrates how we don't even have to have bodies in order to create something that seems to operate on gender or operate with gender. Um, we have two squares here. One is kind of bluish purple, one is kind of pink. And so we might interpret those colors as kind of encoded gender representation. Um, but I think these are not very, these are very obviously not bodies and the squares that you interact with in this game are not um, people in any kind of biological sense. And so there's no, there's no real representation. There's no, there's nothing to be over-sexualized. Uh, it, all of this game has to, all this game is, is about relationships and mechanics. And uh, I should probably give you a link to it, but I'll just Google it real quick. I haven't pulled up on my other computer. Um, but if you want to try it out, I, it's a game that I find perplexing. And I think you will as well. Uh, if you, you can download it if you want, or you can just, there's a web-based version. You can play it as here. So I'll share it um, in case you want to try it out. Um, oh, lots of things happening in the chat here. Oh, so much happening that my Discord is frozen. Uh, cool, okay. So if you wanna try it out, it's a game that like, again, it has to do with mechanics. And so in terms of, as you play, like what you can do is kind of, kind of varies, right? So you can hopefully, is it, you can see me playing, right? Yeah. Um, hovering over squares, hovering over circles, these affect different things. And we can interpret these symbolically. Um, I say we can, I don't, I don't know that I have the interpretation to give you to explain this, uh, but it's something that operates on certain differences that have to do with what happens in, in the system. Like if I hover over this circle, something happens, it goes away. So, okay, what does that mean? And what it means in terms of applying the analogy or the metaphor that the title asks us to is going to play out in terms of gender. Interesting. My computer just like, the fan just like cranked up on my computer um, then went back down. So, okay. I don't know why this game is not particularly demanding. So I don't know uh, why it took so much RAM there for a second, but I guess it's okay. Uh, so this is harder to see like this is we're, we're talking about mechanics or rules So this is the kind of thing to to make an argument about it or to try to understand it. You have to uh, Have to really play a game in order to think about it and whether it makes a difference So when we talk about I'm using a couple of terms here that we haven't focused on much yet uh, in class here But mechanics right these are the things that you can do in the game Right, so in this case as you saw with me playing the game the mechanic the main mechanic is like hovering and clicking and you can hover over the circles, you can click on them, you can hover over the squares, you can click on them. And those are the mechanics. The rules are how the mechanics relate to the goals of the game. And so I don't know what the goals are for the marriage. Um, it's something that I think is an abstract expressionist kind of game. So maybe it doesn't have goals, but uh, the rules of, uh, let's say Tomb Raider are, you know, raid the tomb, get the treasure, right? Solve the, uh, complete the story. Um, so let's see. Oh, interesting. So Kelly's got an interesting point about Cyberpunk 2077. Um, and I have not, because my computer is, is so far away from able to play that, I have not even bothered to look into it other than watching some of the trailers. And the idea of uh, gender is pretty interesting in that game in terms of uh, how you, you know, the, the character you can, you can play as. And, um, you know, also the way that gender relates to uh, biology is pretty interesting in that game from what I understand. So interesting things to consider. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Super Princess Peach. Yeah, you guys are really in, um, you're coming up with better examples than I have. So thank you. That's good. Uh, that's the great thing about this class usually is that students have so many different experiences of gaming. They could come up with uh, even more examples than I can. Uh, but anyway, so, so to understand and try to think about gender in terms of operation means you have to really focus on and understand the operation of the game that you're trying to study. So we'll see that in passage. I'll show that to you in a minute. Um, and Queers in Love at the End of the Universe. Um, we'll see those mechanics, I think, pretty clearly. And that's why I wanted to give you those two games. They're very short and accessible. 
Uh, the marriage is also very short, but I think somewhat opaque. <laughs> but uh, that's that's the idea when we talk about opera operations. So a passage is um, it's linked in the the notes for today, and this is a web-based version of it. Um, it is originally a game you could download and play, but this web-based version should play. I'm not going to click on it just to show it to you now. But um, you play as the character you see depicted here, or that's the character you can control, I should say. I think whether we play as them is sort of a issue, uh, sort of a complicated question. But this is a character, and this is a character that we experience as we play the game. So I would like for you to play this game uh, between now and one o'clock, uh, and pay attention to things like uh, how the gender, how operations in the game might or might not have something to say about gender in the game, and then by uh, in turn gender in the real world. So that is the end of the slideshow. But the big question that I think I'd like to to think about is. If gender identity modifies affordances in real life, as we talked about earlier, certainly gender roles are a thing, um, what can gendered mechanics or operations in video games tell us about those affordances? Can they teach us things? Can they help us change those things? Uh, basically, how can these two uh, relate to each other is my big question. Okay, so these are the things to think about. I'm gonna wrap up the stream here for now, um, but you've got some instructions in Canvas to check out. Um, you should have those links on that first page for this week. So please take a look at that. And I will be back streaming again at one o'clock uh, to share some notes and to kind of wrap, our, wrap up our discussion for today. All right, I will see you later. Bye.